Southeast. The judicial, executive, and legislative branches, and Mr. Obama himself, have been served with petitions for redress of this grievance pursuant to the First Amendment's accountability clause, the last ten words of the First Amendment. Unfortunately, in spite of the good faith efforts of numerous attorneys and ordinary American citizens, there has been no responsive response. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injuries. The latest injury, today's ruling by the Supreme Court, not to hear the D'Onofrio case. Last week, Senator Martinez issued a statement saying that the voters have determined Mr. Obama's eligibility. Recently, a judge in Hawaii, in response to a lawsuit there, seeking, asking the state officials to provide access to Mr. Obama's original birth certificate, the judge there ruled it would be an invasion of his privacy if he were to issue that order. Before that, a judge in Pennsylvania ruled that Mr. Berg, Attorney Berg, had no standing because his injury, if there were a ineligible person serving as president, would be no different than the, from the injury to be suffered by everybody else in the country and therefore he has no standing and therefore the court has no jurisdiction. So in other words, there seems to be a, a conspiracy of silence on the merits of these claims. The implied message, of course, is that the voters have spoken, the voters have determined Mr. Obama's eligibility. But this is not a democracy. We have here a constitutional republic. The Constitution is a set of principles to govern the government. We're not mentioned except we the people adopt the document. As the supreme law of the land, it is all that stands between the people and total tyranny and despotism. The Constitution is not a menu. We do not get to pick and choose which parts or prohibitions or restrictions we're going to enforce. Words have meaning. It's well understood in American jurisprudence that the words in the Constitution have the meaning they had when they were added to the Constitution. Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution explicitly requires that any person who assumes the office of the president must be a natural-born citizen. These words, of course, have legal consequence. They were well understood at the time of our founding, both distinguishing and elevating the express requirements of citizenship necessary to become president. It was critical to our founders that whoever held the office must not suffer of a division of loyalties, whether arising as an effect of birth in a foreign land, of parentage of divided nationalities, or of prior allegiances to other nations. This is the essence of the natural born citizen clause. That it was intended to safeguard our republic from any outside interest or in or influence that might at any point compromise the judgment, acts, or integrity of the office of the president. Although the phrase natural born citizen contains only these three small words, it, like many other words and phrases in the Constitution, is part of a grand design. Indeed, a divinely inspired design for the creation of a form of government intentionally engineered to protect and propagate the essential principles of liberty and individual rights necessary to enjoy the essential gifts endowed upon the people by their creator, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For whatever reasons, and over many decades, the people of America have allowed their government officials to stray from this majestic design. The nation has been allowed to embark on campaigns of populist benevolence, political convenience, and the naked expediency of those who profit from the bounty of government. 
each tortuous step away from our Constitution and its essential principles have inflicted another blow on the Republic and the freedom of its people. One need look no further than the front page of the morning papers to witness the continuing consequences of constitutional appeasement. In violation of the War Powers Clauses, we have on dozens of occasions since World War II applied our armed forces in hostilities overseas without the required constitutional declarations of war, spilling much blood and treasure and turning our people, other people, against us. We have against our founders sound advice and in violation of the money clauses of the Constitution established a fiat currency and central banking system owned by a cartel of private banks that manufactures one crisis after another while prescribing solutions that benefit them and, their, and the corporations that spring up around them but at everybody else's expense. In violation of the privacy clauses of the Constitution we have an emerging police state. In violation of the faithfully execute clause of the Constitution in Article 2, we have allowed millions of illegal, undocumented foreign nationals to invade the country, resulting in immeasurable human and economic disruptions for our people while burdening our limited resources and national infrastructure. In violation of the tax clauses of the Constitution, we have allowed the government to take the bread out of the mouths of labor by imposing a direct, unapportioned, tax on labor in violation of the tax clauses of the Constitution. And in violation of the Second Amendment, we have allowed the government to pass laws aimed at disarming the people, removing their ability to defend themselves from a tyrannical government. It is interesting to note that the Constitution's requirement for apportionment of all direct taxes that pays for all of this is the only clause in the Constitution repeated twice. Make no mistake, the government has stepped way outside the boundaries that the people have drawn around its power. The We the People Foundation for, educa for Constitutional Education has but one agenda, to defend the Republic by holding the government accountable to the Constitution. We have confronted the government at many turns over many issues, exercising the profound but little known power in the First Amendment the right to petition government for a redress or for a remedy of constitutional violations. It is this clause that the scholars call the capstone right. It's the right that gives the people the ability to peacefully hold the government, the servant government, accountable. Today we find ourselves here to discuss just three words found in the great constitution, natural born citizen. The specifics of the lawsuits that have been filed in defense of this clause vary, but there is but one underlying ideal that has driven all of us to act in the defense of liberty and to be here today. Ultimately, it's not about who is or is not eligible to become president. It's about preserving the one thing our republic cannot and will not long survive without, and that is the rule of law. According to Senator Martinez, who was responding recently, last week he released, on December 1st, a letter released to a constituent asking him about this natural born citizen clause and seeking redress. And what he said was this, presidential candidates are vetted by voters at least twice first in the primary elections and again in the general election. President-elect Obama won the Democratic Party's nomination after one of the most fiercely contested presidential primaries in American history. And he has now been duly elected by the majority of the voters in the United States. Throughout both the primary and general election, concerns about Mr. Obama's birthplace were raised. The voters have made clear their view that Mr. Obama meets the qualifications to hold the office of president. Mr. Martinez is wrong. He would have us believe that our form of government is a democracy rather than a constitutional republic. From the perspective of the law of the Constitution, 
It matters little what the voters have previously said if Mr. Obama is in fact not legally eligible to hold the office of president. It is not too great a burden to demand that one who seeks the office of president simply produce evidence establishing his legal eligibility. What are the consequences of Mr. Obama's refusal to respond to our open letter published twice last week in the Chicago Tribune? What are the effects of Mr. Obama's continuing silence when under well-established law silence is equated with fraud when there is a legal duty to respond. It is well settled in American jurisdiction.